are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My very special co-host today is Bob Trapani, Jr., author, photographer, lighthouse technician, and executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. Hi, Bob. Hi, Jeremy. How are you? I'm great. Thank you so much for coming down from uh, Owl's Head in uh, beautiful Midcoast, Maine today. Oh, it's always a pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure to be talking lighthouses and uh, on this beautiful day. I wouldn't miss it. Oh, it is gorgeous. We should be outside, but we're in here in the the famous Bluefish Boulevard recording studios to, to get this done. And as a matter of fact, it's great to be recording in person today because I've just started recording these episodes in person again after whatever it's been, 15 or so months during that time we've been recording, uh, you know, in various uh, online methods, Zoom and so forth. It's great to be uh, almost back to normal. It does feel great. It really mm-hmm. does. So this is episode 125 of Lighthearted. Today is June 27th, 2021. In a couple of minutes, we're going to hear an interview with a man who was one of the last Coast Guard keepers at remote Boone Island off the southern Maine coast. First, I thought I'd mention the fact that a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the 250th anniversary of the first Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse here on the New Hampshire seacoast, about 15 minutes from where we are right now. Portsmouth Harbor Light is one you have a lot of experience with, Bob, uh, because it's managed by our local chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation, and you've certainly been there many, many times over the years. Absolutely. It's a it's an awesome spot, and you know, I want to start off because I know when we took, uh, I was able to have the pleasure of taking part in the uh, 250th uh, virtual program that you uh, helped lead. I realized that nobody actually thanked you for putting that all together. At <laughs> least I didn't hear that because I had to leave a little early. So maybe they did. But uh, I want to thank you because that was a lot of work that nobody ever is going to realize what went into that. But, you know, we couldn't really celebrate it maybe the way we had wanted to. But you did the next best thing, and all the guests involved. Everybody was awesome, and so I want to I, I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you for thanking me. I, I really appreciate that, and it was it was a lot of work, but it was certainly worth it. It was a, a great event, and we did have some uh, special guests from the Coast Guard and our uh, congressional uh, delegation, and so forth. And uh, it, it was uh, I was very pleased with it. And people seem to enjoy it. We're hoping to maybe do an in-person event uh, before the season's over. Uh, you know, uh, nothing is definite yet, but uh, maybe in the fall we can do have some sort of live live event rather than a virtual event. And uh, we are currently giving small private tours by reservation on Sunday afternoons, and we're just uh, adding some Friday evening tours through the month of July uh, at 7 o'clock on Fridays. And uh, it's still up in the air, so what's going to happen after that for the rest of the season? But if people keep an eye on PortsmouthHarborLighthouse.org, hopefully we'll be making some announcements in the coming weeks. Oh, that's something to look forward to. Awesome. Well, you know what a great place it is. So uh, I know a lot of listeners know you as the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. I'm sure a lot of them are also familiar with the books you've written on lighthouse history and uh, your photography, which uh, a lot of them have, have seen online, I know. Uh, something they might not know is that you're also in the Coast Guard Auxiliary and you're a certified lighthouse technician. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people actually know that, but it is something that I've been doing now for 21 years. I uh, started out in 2000 at the Easy Navigation Team in Cape May and uh, worked out of there until 2005 and then came to Maine. A little bit out South Portland, a little bit on Cutter Abbey Burgess, mm-hmm. three years on Cutter Tackle, and the last 11 years with the AIDS Navigation Team out of Southwest Harbor. Uh, I find the, the work amazing. Uh, it's, it's something that you feel like you have a meaningful contribution to. Uh, I know the lights are not as relied upon as they once were, but they're still AIDS Navigation. So mm-hmm. having a chance to help assist in uh, keeping the lights and the horns watching properly uh, it, it feels like there's this continuation of, of the tradition of keeping a good light. So uh, it's a very rewarding endeavor. And then also gives me a chance to see lighthouses. Uh, I see them from the preservation side with the American Lighthouse Foundation and the utilitarian side uh, with the uh, Coast Guard work. So it, it really does give you a well-rounded experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I've said it before. You're one of the few people who's able to see lighthouses from two very different angles there from the historic angle and the, uh, the technology-based and navigational a- angles, which are all an important part of why lighthouses exist, of course. 
So our interview today is with one of the last keepers of Boone Island Light, which is uh, several miles off the coast of southern Maine, not too far north of uh, Portsmouth here. I photographed uh, Boone Island Lighthouse from boats. I've flown over it in a helicopter. I have never been on the island. I'd like to, I think, although I know it's not easy to get on there. Uh, so in your role as a lighthouse technician, I know you've actually been on the island, Bob. So what was that experience like? I have been on the island. I've been on the island actually twice. Uh, once as uh, when I was working briefly out of uh, AIDS and Navigation Museum South Portland and once with uh, a contractor. Incredible experience. And maybe if you don't mind, I'd actually like to... Uh, I In 2006, when I did my first visit, I did end up right after there writing some thoughts down, you know, you know in journal-like thoughts. And if mm-hmm. you don't mind, I'd like to maybe read a few of them and... Absolutely. Sure. Okay. So you were, what, about 15, 15 years ago when you wrote that? Yeah, that was 15 years ago when I wrote that, Jeremy. Right, but I'm saying yeah. you were 15 years old at the no, time, right? No, I right? wasn't 15 years old. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe a little more than that. All right. I'm going to read one of my first entries. Quote, My first impression of the island was one of awe. I could feel that this was a different place altogether than what I have experienced before. There is no question that my awareness of the legend, lore, and stormy history that surround Boone Island contributed to this feeling, but even without any prior knowledge of this fascinating and sometimes downright harrowing history, the island still exudes a sense of inescapable desolation and danger like nothing I had ever felt up to that point Hmm. in my life. I can say, Jeremy, that in Maine, um, the only other lights that even come close are places like Mount Desert Rock, Halfway Rock, maybe Saddleback Ledge. I, I know you've been on Mount Desert Rock. I've been on Mount Desert Rock. I've been on Halfway Rock. Uh, they're pretty desolate. Mount Desert Rock, when I was, that's so far offshore. What is it? Uh, like 20, 20, more than 20 miles yeah, offshore. Yeah, 24, 26 miles. Yeah. And uh, to me, it felt like uh, really being on another planet. I mean, because you can't see uh, land, any other land from there. And uh, you feel like you're on this little rocky island unto itself. I mean, rocky planet, I meant to say, uh, unto itself. You really feel removed from uh, civilization there. Um, But it's a, I think it's a little bigger than Boone Island, isn't it? Um, It's got a little bit of grass on there, too. A little bit, and a little, I think a little bit more elevation, ever so slightly. Uh, I I think the thing with Boone Island is that strikes you is this on this small little islet, you have this daunting tower. It's just, Mm -hmm. it's imposing. It really is. And uh, it, it sort of almost looks a little out of place, being so tall on such yeah. a small little islet. But if you don't care, I think I'll read a few more if you, if you don't mind. Sure, please go right ahead, yeah. All right. Quote, the seagulls were relentless in their squawking, which went on literally the whole time we were on the island. At that time, we were doing a battery change out at Boone Island, and we were there from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. The loud cries were magnified by the presence of many hundreds of agitated gulls, It seemed like we were living in a real-life Stephen King film. The birds dove on us and dropped their slimy white excretions as if they were fighter bombers seeking out moving targets, us. Some of the crew did get hit, and this white ordnance strafed their uniforms and even one person's head. I also had come out of the tower at one point. We've made multiple trips up in the tower, and I remember coming out, and about four to five feet away from me as I come out the door is this hawk looking straight at me. And this hawk was not welcomed. It was definitely the gulls were trying very hard to, to get it to leave because it was going after the, the young yeah. and even some of the eggs. And at times was successful. It was, it was definitely determined. Um, but to be that close to a hawk unexpectedly was, he was just sitting there perched on some of the ruins of the old house. Mm-hmm. But I'll, I'll read a, a few more here. I said, I, I was truly amazed at how the ocean is literally at your front door. As we worked inside the little generator shed, which is adjacent to the tower, I looked out the door and observed the sea at high tide, which seemed close enough for me to almost reach out and touch. Of course it wasn't, but that's just from a perspective, because we really actually got there at low tide. So to see it, you know, see it at low tide and then watch the uh, sea just move in on you. All I could think of was, if it looked this close on a relatively calm day, what kind of place was this when the power of the sea was whipped to frenzy and towering waves 20 to 30 feet were sweeping across this forlorn islet. It was a sobering sight to watch the tide recede and being able to observe the clean ledge that was exposed in its wake. This was nothing out of the ordinary except that 
just one look around the small island revealed the fact that the angry seas in the past had pushed all the movable rocks and boulders up into a pile of sorts into the center of the island. The rest of the desolate ledge was as clean as could be other than the slime, moss, and seaweed that clung to the polished aspects of the rock. Hmm. The power of the sea must be something to behold when the tempest rages unabated across this rocky perch, barely above sea level. Talk about a spot where there's no place to hide. To think that such massive stones could be moved and carried around the island by the mighty waves like it was child's play. One other aspect of Boone Island that really struck me was how devoid it, it just seemed of compassion. There were dead carcasses of birds were easy to spot, as are a plethora of clean small bones presumably left behind by predator hawks. I also noticed a number of seagull eggs left in their nest, abandoned, for one reason or another, or other eggs that had rolled out of their nest and just laying up against the rocks, not to be returned. At one point, the hawk did grab an egg with his claws only to drop it on the ledge as the seagulls were in hot pursuit of him. One other thing, when you make about six trips up the light in that period of time, you're kind of bored, you're kind of tired. <laughs> but one of the things I said, I'm going to count these stairs. So I did. And the lighthouse contains 150 cast iron steps, 12 smaller cast iron steps that lead from the watch room to the lantern, and eight wooden steps that actually lead into the lantern. The lighthouse has a total of 170 steps. And I'll tell you, when you make multiple climbs of that, I can imagine the keepers of old, they must have been in shape because uh, I was pretty exhausted after all that. How many climbs that day? About six. Oh, wow. That reminds me of... Uh... The, the girl in the 1870s, Annie Bell Hobbs, daughter of an assistant keeper who wrote an article about life there and talked about how visitors would come in the summer and expect a tour of the lighthouse. And that was her, her duty to, to give them a tour. And she said it was a, a little uh, strenuous to go up and down that tower a few times a day. Uh, so uh, I think you can appreciate Benjamin being a 14-year-old girl and, and doing that. Um, Although she might have been in better shape than we were. <laughs> well, that's possible. That's possible. I was thinking, as I said that, I thought maybe that's maybe that's the case. But you know, we did see a lot of seals that day too. But of mm. course, when they 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 saw us on the island, they they just headed for the water and they decided yeah. they were just going to watch us from the, from that safe area. So yeah, yeah. Well, Kirby, when people hear the uh, interview, Kirby uh, Eldridge, the former keeper, talks about the uh, all the numerous seals that are out there all the time. One other thing, Jeremy, that struck me was, and I know you've seen this from photographs and everybody who's been out to Boone Island and photographed it has probably seen it, but the uh, tapered base mm -hmm. of the lighthouse is actually an interesting architectural it aspect. It is, it is. And, yeah. uh, and actually, uh, you know, the, the engineers, the architects really knew what they were doing with that because when you think about the sea coming in, if that tower just went straight down into the ledge, this was breaking the seas. As we know, the seas can sweep that's directly over. Right. So that's, uh, although it's a very similar tower to Petit Manan, Petit Manan does not have that tapered base. Right. I have been on Petit Manan and I can uh, verify that. Yeah. In fact, I, you know, I didn't think that much about the base of Boone Island until I saw a picture of you right up against it. There's a, there's a picture that was taken that day when you were, you were yeah, there? Yeah, it's actually a quite, that's a quite large base. Really. Yeah, yeah, it is. It yeah. is. Yeah, it's pretty massive, even though the lighthouse is so tall and slender. Well, thank you for reading those journal entries. You know, as you're reading them, it reminds me of uh, our mutual friend, uh, Chris Mills, who wrote uh, journal entries when he was in his 20s at uh, various Canadian lighthouses and included some of those in his book, Vanishing Lights. Oh, so, they are a joy to, when Chris was reading those or just to read his book, that's yeah. just, uh, it, it takes you away. You almost feel like you're there. I agree. Yeah. Chris is a great writer, but so are you. And it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it's it's good that you did this because... Uh, none of our memories, uh, you know, stay with us forever. It's it's important to uh, to write these things down. Uh, I actually try to make it a regular habit when I visit some of these places to do that because I know that it, a month later or two months later you forget all those details. Mm -hmm. So you got a you got a broad understanding, but if you don't pen it, write it down, put it on the computer, you will you will lose some of that. So yeah. Well, again, thank you for for reading those. So let's move on and talk a little bit a little about the history of uh, Boone Island Light Station and our guest today. Boone Island is located in southern Maine, about six miles from the nearest point of land. The popular writer Celia Thaxter once called the small rocky island quote the forlornest place that can be imagined end quote. It was the scene of many shipwrecks over the years, including the wreck of the British Nottingham Galley in December 1710, an incident that was later the basis of a novel by Kenneth Roberts. 
An unlighted day beacon was built on the island in 1799, and it had to be rebuilt six years later when the original tower was destroyed in a storm. For the safety of local fishermen and coastal trading vessels, a lighthouse replaced the day beacon in 1811. The original wooden tower was only 32 feet tall. After suffering great damage in storms, the lighthouse was rebuilt in 1831. It was built of rubble stone and stood 49 feet tall. It was still too short to be seen for much distance, so the lighthouse that stands today was constructed in 1854. The slender granite tower stands 133 feet tall, making it the tallest lighthouse in the New England states. A second order Fresnel lens in the new tower was first lighted on January 1, 1855. Captain William C. Williams, also known as Willie Williams, a native of nearby Kittery, Maine, went to Boone Island as an assistant in 1885 and then served as principal keeper from 1888 to 1911. He later told author Robert Thayer Sterling about his feelings in his early years on the island. He said, quote, The seas would clean the ledge right off sometimes. I was always thinking over just what I would do in order to save my life should the whole station be swept away, end quote. Boone Island was a family light station for many years, with as many as three keepers and their families living there. In later years, only male keepers lived on the island without their families. The Coast Guard automated the station soon after the disastrous blizzard of 1978, which is the subject of today's interview. The second order Fresnel lens was replaced by a modern optic in 1993, and the old lens is now on display at the Kittery Historical and Naval Museum. The property was made available at no cost to a new owner under the guidelines of the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act, but there were no applicants. As a result, it was put up for sale by online auction in May 2014. The property is now owned by Bobby Sager, a Boston philanthropist. Kirby Eldridge and Leo Berry were the last keepers on the island. After his time in the Coast Guard, Kirby spent about 17 years in the Army, followed by 25 years working as a systems engineer until his recent retirement. He lives today in Georgia. I had the pleasure of speaking with Kirby Eldridge recently, and let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking today with Kirby Eldridge, who was one of the final keepers at Boone Island Lighthouse in Maine, uh, just before it was automated. Thank you so much for joining me today, Kirby. I appreciate it. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to uh, talking to you about this. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Uh, Boone Island is several miles off the coast of Southern Maine. I think a lot of our listeners are probably familiar with it. It's a pretty well-known lighthouse. It's not far from where I live here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Again, just uh, just off the coast of Southern Maine. I've written a lot about Boone Island. I've talked about it many times in my lectures. I've narrated cruises that have gone near it. I've flown over it in a helicopter. I've never actually been on the island. But I've been on, I've seen it from all possible angles, except for actually being on it. Um, I've also written about what happened during the blizzard of 78 at Boone Island, 1978, very famous storm. But I never knew the names of the two Coast Guard keepers who were on the island during that blizzard. So I was really excited uh, when I got an email from you, Kirby, uh, recently, mm -hmm. telling me that you were one of those two keepers. And I, it was like finding treasure. I was, I was really, really excited about that. So we're going to talk about the blizzard shortly, but I, I'd like to start first by talking a bit about what life was like there in general at Boone Island, but maybe a little bit of background first on you. Where are you from originally? I come from a small town in upstate New York. Uh, it's called West Carthage. It's up on the Canadian border near Fort Drum is probably the biggest area that somebody might have heard of mm. or Watertown, New York, that area. Oh, sure. Yeah. Pretty small town, not near any oceans. <laughs> well, I, I went to college for a while at Colgate University, but that's upstate New York, but I think it's kind of far from where, where you grew up. But uh, so I know parts of upstate New York, but not the, not the town that you're, you're from originally. And, and where do you live now? I live down in uh, Stapleton, Georgia, on a small hobby farm. Okay. What does that mean, hobby farm, exactly? What do you have on the farm? I have cows and goats and chickens and all that. Uh, large uh, farming, um, as far as vegetable garden and that kind of stuff, but not enough to make a living, so it's mm -hmm. a hobby. <laughs> okay. Well, that's great. That's great. I actually, uh, I found you on Facebook, actually, and I saw pictures of you with uh, dogs. So you have, uh, you have dogs on the farm also? Uh, definitely have a lot. We have a couple uh, uh, yellow labs that mm -hmm. uh, we have. We have a small 
finish lap hound, and then I have a great Pyrenees that stays with the goats. He's a livestock protection. Oh, neat. Yeah, you know, they're beautiful dogs in the pictures. I enjoyed looking at that. So let's uh, talk about your, your Coast Guard career and your Lighthouse career. When, when did you join the Coast Guard? In 1975, I actually enlisted on the delayed enlistment while I was still in high school. Some people may wonder how I ever picked the Coast Guard growing up pretty much in the Adirondack Mountains, but I saw a film actually of it and uh, of like a recruiter came in and showed it. It looked pretty neat. I just remember a guy telling me that most at that time in 75, most of the military, Army, Navy, Marines did a lot of training where the Coast Guard did their mission every day. Mm. And that seemed to appeal to me. That's a great branch of the service. So before you went to Boone Island, uh, what kind of service, uh, what kind of duty did you have uh, in the Coast Guard? Well, um, real runner through, it wasn't a lot, but I went to uh, Yorktown, Virginia for uh, MK, machinery technician training, basically a glorified diesel, marine diesel mechanic and slash jack of all trades with anything that was mechanical. They kind of taught you everything. Mm -hmm. And my first duty station was the U.S. Coast Cutter Coast Guard Cutter Vigilant out of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Probably one of the highlights of that, which I really loved going to see. It was neat. But we did the uh, rescue of the Argo Merchant, which was uh, uh, a big oil tanker off of Cape Cod uh -huh. right over the Christmas holidays that we uh, went out there. We rescued the crew. Wow. We did the, uh, I actually got to go on the damage assessment crew and we went on board and checked it out. And then eventually, I think the Navy blew it up but because uh, they couldn't figure out what to do with it. We set the record for the vigilant for the number of helicopter landings on, on the deck of the ship during that time. Yeah, well, that's a pretty famous rescue at the Argo Merchant. Huh? Yeah. yeah, Wait, was that, that was during a storm, was it? Yeah, it's, he, basically, I think <laughs> the skipper might have fell asleep or something, but he hit a sandbar. Mm -hmm. went aground and then they got the storm the storm really tore it up quite a bit and it finally broke right in half yeah won the uh both sections around and then before the storm was over it almost put it back together mm -hmm. i had some pictures wow. in the scrapbook of showing it how it moved around wow yeah no i, I definitely remember that uh, so, uh, before you went to Boone Island, so Boone Island was your first light station duty. Is that correct? Right. I, they had a thing in the coast guard where you could put a, like a bulletin and say, if you'd like to swap duties and a guy that was on the lighthouse wanted to go to, a a great white, a big white one is what they used to call them. <laughs> and I had been out for a year and a half and I was like, that sounds pretty good going to a lighthouse. So when you said that, that looks pretty good. Did you, you probably hadn't seen any pictures of Boone Island yet at that point. Didn't have a clue what it looked like. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Were you a little shocked when you, when you got there? What was your impression of it when you arrived? Well, I'm trying to remember. That's a good question. I'm trying to remember the very first time I saw it. Um, and I think it was by small boat when we went out there. And I just remember looking at, there's nothing here. It's just, mm -hmm. especially as you're coming, say like a mile or so out, all it is is a tower sticking on a rock, and there's nothing else. Yeah. It was. Uh, I don't. I don't really. I'll be honest with you. I don't really remember like what my thoughts were. It was just okay. Here's the next thing to do. Yeah, I would say uh, barren is a nice word for Boone Island. There's yeah. a lot of different uh, words you could use for it. It's just a, it's a little pile of rocks, uh, six or seven miles out in the ocean. It's a, maybe a bit over six miles from the nearest point of land. Uh, it's really, it's like being in the middle of the ocean. It's hard to believe, hard to believe that anybody could have lived there. Uh, but maybe even harder to believe that families lived there for years. You know, kids grew up on that little pile of rocks out there, which is. Yeah. Uh, Especially before uh, modern kind of convenience. I, I can't even imagine living there in the late 18, early 1900s. That had to have been a tough winter. Yeah, yeah. I always uh, think of this this 14 year old girl in the 1800s, named, the daughter of a keeper. Her name was Annie Bell Hobbs. She wrote an article about life there and she said, I live here on Boone Island where I am a prisoner with privilege of the yard. <laughs> <laughs> she, was, she was like she was in prison, but at least she could go out in the rocks. And also, Celia Thaxter, the local writer, called Boone Island 
the forlornest place that could be imagined. I thought that was a good description. <laughs> so, uh, so you went there in, uh, we're talking uh, 77, right? When you, yes, yeah. yeah, summer of 77, is that right? Mm -hmm. So we went out there and it was not bad when I first got there. there was, we had a nice house. Um, and I'll tell you, as a young guy, when they said, you know, you come out here for two weeks and then you get to go home that sounded like a pretty good deal. So that rotation for a young single guy sounded not too bad. Yeah. That, that part is a good deal. So what was it like? There was there at one time there were two keepers houses there, but when you were there, there was just one house, right? Right. We had when when I was on there, we had the, the house that was connected through a little causeway to the tower. Mm -hmm. There was a generator block building generator shed that also had, tools and that kind of things we kept in it and then there was a small boathouse that kept what we called a pea pod in it and that was a small boat like rowboat that mm -hmm. we used for getting on and off the island yeah yeah so what were the accommodations like in the house they were actually pretty good um, yeah we each had a bedroom they had the upstairs um also had a like a lounge area with a pool table and we had a big in those days a pretty good sized tv the toilet was interesting. Um, may not be the best topic, but you burned. I'm curious. It. Uh, you burned it. Okay. Yeah. So you uh, did your business, and then you stepped on a pedal when you got off, and then ignited it. Wow. And uh, it burned whatever was in there. So the first couple of times, it was a, a unique experience. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, it works right. I would hate yeah. for that to. We never had a problem with it. I will say that. Oh, that's it, good. It, it, it seems like there's all kinds of possibilities for. For bad things to happen with something like that. <laughs> Glad it worked right. So uh, you mentioned you had two weeks on and two weeks off, right? Yeah. And uh, what? Yeah, uh, yeah, I was off and at my hometown so often that my friends and stuff didn't even realize I was still in the service. They thought I got out. It was good. And I even got a little side hustle going. My dad hung out at a local tavern and his friends all liked fresh lobster like most people. Mm-hmm. Well, I could get lobsters dirt cheap right there in Portsmouth. So I would bring, he'd take orders and I'd bring lobsters home <laughs> on my trip, sell them, and it would pay for my trip every every two weeks. So good deal. The, would they assign, what, four men to the station? And two? Yeah, we had four guys on our crew. Um, yeah. There was actually three petty officers, third class, and, and then uh, the station commander, I guess, for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. was uh, a petty officer first class. Okay. But there are always two men on at a time. Is that always right? two? Yes. And you mentioned the Peapod boat. Is that usually how you get back and forth from the mainland to the island? Well, we, we occasionally, they would have a helicopter that was on duty doing some patrols or whatever they happened to do. And if they did, they would take us by helicopter. Mm -hmm. And that was always like, yes, because it was a pretty quick trip. They had a little landing pad out there on the island. You get out. It was, it was no, you know, no, no drama, but yeah. the normal way was we'd take a 41 foot patrol boat from Portsmouth Harbor and it was a pretty good ride out there. And then once we got out there, the Peapod, the guy in the, that was leaving his shift, he would get in the Peapod, unhook it from the cable. It would slide down this ramp because the water in the rocks, there was too rough a surf for you to go down there. Mm -hmm. And it would take you about 30 feet out into the water. And if you were getting some surfs, that could be a pretty exciting ride, slide down that board. Yeah, I bet. And you'd row out to the 41 footer was, we'd get him and his baggage up. And then you would transfer, because when we first got there, they would give you, we had, we'd get cash from the station commander at Portsmouth and go to the local grocery store and buy our groceries mm -hmm. for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we had to get those into the pea pod with yourself. And believe me, there was times that <laughs> if you made it in the boat without getting wet, it was a miracle. And a couple of times we lost a guy over the side and sometimes even with his groceries. But OK, I was going to ask if you ever lost the, the groceries. Uh, yeah, we, we lost groceries, baggage, you know, your sea bag. <laughs> Occasionally you had to fish them out. But yeah. You got remember, better at it after it depended a lot on the weather and you being in Portsmouth know the weather can be kind of bad sometimes. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Anywhere uh, in New England by the by the ocean, it can change fast. It can do the sea can. So just, then can the be guy a... coming on would row in, and the, the last guy left on the on the island would hook a cable. Once you got close to shore, and they'd pull you back off the ramp, mm. and that was usually the worst part because mm -hmm. right where the surf was breaking, depending on how the waves hit and where you were on that cable, kind of like a helium balloon on a string, you might go any which way. But yeah, right. That's how did, we got on and off. Uh huh. Did you ever try to land on the ramp? Did you ever flip over completely? Never flipped that pea pod. Mm -hmm. Not when I was there. Yeah, I've heard of that. Water happening. in it, but we never flipped it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It reminded me of a. I interviewed a guy who was a keeper at Halfway Rock Light in Maine, which is another really isolated one offshore. Uh -huh. And he said uh, one time the TV had just been fixed and it was coming back in the boat from the mainland and the and the boat. I think it completely flipped on the the ramp and the you know, the TV went to the bottom. So after waiting for at least a couple of weeks for it to be fixed, they had to get a whole new TV after that. So. <laughs> That's a bad thing to lose out on the lighthouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you you had a TV you mentioned there, and could you actually see much? How many channels could it get? Do you remember? Actually, it was kind of like the modern day cable because we had pretty much line of sight from Portland down to Boston. So any TV channel all the way down through, we got mm -hmm. them clear as a bell. So we had a lot of channels, a lot of duplicates, but we had a lot of channels. So the TV was a big hit. Uh, we we did watch a lot of TV. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking mid seventies. Was it still black and white, or do you have color? Do you remember? <laughs> you know, I'm trying to think. I I don't really remember. That's about kind of when a lot of people are starting to get color TVs. I think. So but we probably did not have one. <laughs> I would I'd be surprised. Yeah. So we've talked to we've talked a bit about how you got uh, groceries and supplies out there, but you know, how did that whole process typically work? How the process worked was. Whoever was on the lighthouse, whatever team was out there, would radio in on usually Sunday night saying, here's what we're out of. Mm -hmm. And they'd give you, they'd get a list. And then just before you went shopping, you'd radio them one more time and say, hey, is there anything else? So you'd bring that and go ahead and, and do that. And because of the way we rotated, there was somebody coming out every Monday. So the way it was offset. And okay. you, had, you were with a different guy each week. And then we had uh, water. We had a large cistern inside the house mm -hmm. that collected rainwater off the roof. And then yeah. uh, one time when I was out there, they brought a tanker out and filled the cistern because it was getting low. We had to take a big, long hose. They brought it all in. We got it all the way in there. And, you know, you radioed them. All right, hit it. They filled the cistern and then tell them okay shut off and then they'd pull the hose back up and that was the same way they filled our fuel tanks mm -hmm. we had three five i think they were five thousand gallon fuel tanks that they would they filled one time when i was there so mm -hmm. that i remember yeah so the water in the cistern you used it i'm sure for a lot of different purposes did you actually drink that water yes we did was it was it cleaned in any way or uh, did you boil it or anything like that or how, how what kind of water was it the, the only thing about it is sometimes it was a little salty. Oh, okay. We didn't, we never, we never filtered it or anything. And that was kind of before bottled water, as I recall. So I know at some places they had a system where they would, uh, when it first started raining, they had a, they would divert the, the rain, the water away from the cistern and have it drain off outside. And then when the, all the gull stuff was washed off the roof, they would divert it back into the cistern um so that the dirtiest stuff didn't get in there but you probably should have had that. <laughs> <laughs> well it's a little late to, to worry about it now i guess but you, you survived it so uh w before we started the interview here we we're talking about how many stairs there are in the lighthouse and i i think there's something like 166 or 168 i think it's uh it's around there if i remember correctly yeah, uh right okay there was a lot of them yeah, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, I haven't, I've only climbed a handful of lighthouses that are that tall or taller, but how many times a day did you, do you think you typically had to go up and down those stairs? You always had to go at least twice. Mm -hmm. um, so what you did is in the morning when you shut the light off, you went up the stairs and there was a canvas cloth that you put over the lens. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that kind of helped protect the lens and it also stopped any 
re reflections from the sunlight and throwing people like wanting to know what that light was or something. So, so you covered that. Um, and then at night, just before you turned it on, you went back up and, and covered it again, uncovered mm -hmm. it again. Also, if it was bad weather, or bad visibility, you may go back up and turn it on and, and leave it on all day, depending. This was all weather dependent. There was a buoy. I, I can't remember exactly what it, what number it was, but it was an ocean buoy that had a light on it. Mm -hmm. And if we lost sight of that light, then we would turn during the day, then we would turn our light on. That was kind of our oh, okay. age, knowing it was yeah, it's getting bad visibility. And I don't remember the distance to it, but so you said you well, turned the light on, or what about the fog? The foghorn. Okay, foghorn was a little different. We would normally we had I'm trying to remember exactly what we use for our reference point, but we had a reference point on the fog, and we also sometimes were told there was a fog bank coming in and to get it on. Mm -hmm. But normally you could see it coming, and the foghorn was unbelievably loud. I couldn't, the very first time I heard it, I couldn't believe it. Um, I mean, it, the windows rattled and pictures shook and ours was timed at every 10 seconds. So every time, 10 seconds, you would have that. And, and I do remember like thinking the first time I was in a foggy period, I'll never sleep. And this could <laughs> drive me nuts too. I don't yeah, know. Yeah. But after, a, you know, a few days of fog, you actually had to stop and go is the foghorn still going on and, right uh, so, you tune it out yeah. yeah i've heard from other people that they it, they learned to sleep through it and then they would wake up when the horn stopped that that would wake them up the silence would wake them up yeah it's incredibly loud i'm just telling you unless you've stood you know and our horn was pretty close it was right off the back of the generator shed yeah which was probably maybe 50 feet from the house it was loud <laughs> yeah do you think it affected your hearing um i'm wearing hearing aids now so <laughs> maybe <laughs> it didn't help that's for sure we definitely didn't wear any hearing protection we probably wouldn't nowadays but right right so when there were two of you out there did you have shifts did you have like 12 hour shifts or how did that work we had the what we normally did in kind of a, a normal day we each had um so there was station duties like cleanup you had to do and maintenance around there and checking the generators, doing the dishes. We took turns cooking meals. And then one of our main duties or one duty we had is every four hours, we would call into Portsmouth and report the weather. We had a little weather station that had the wind speed and mm -hmm. I think barometer and a couple other little gauges and we just read those. And so at night we would take turns like if i did the midnight the other guy would do the four o'clock in the morning you know he'd set an alarm up um so we would do that every four hours and that was kind of that and then and the standard you know things have to be painted things have to be clean just mm -hmm. that kind of stuff sure sure i'm sure there was plenty to do but there there also had to be some time when there wasn't a whole lot to do so what did you do to pass the hours when you weren't working you, you found stuff to do you watched tv you read books sometimes you went out and uh, counted the seals because we yeah. had a lot of seals as neighbors there's still um, there's still a lot of seals there i can tell you yeah, that you yeah. go out there and sometimes we had a little game and see how many seals you could tr get between you you'd get between the ocean and the seals mm -hmm. and so if you could get, sneak down there and get like i got 10 of them trapped <laughs> and the next guy he would go do it and see if he could set the record but yeah. little stuff like that we did a little fishing there was one incident i remember it was a, one of those rare calm days and me and my partner out there decided it'd be a good idea to row to shore mm -hmm. in our pea pod i know that wasn't a really smart idea we didn't think it through real good but we thought we're young we can do it so we we hopped in the pea pod, slid down the ramp, and started rowing. And, the, and then, like I said, it was perfectly calm. We were doing pretty good. I think we were with the tide, mm -hmm. so we were doing okay. And we had portable radios that we always carried with us. Right. Well, we got a call from Portsmouth Harbor that the station commander decided he was going to come out and visit. <laughs> the, and we were probably, probably over two miles now 
away from the light headed to shore. Yeah. So we spun around and we both, I mean, we really worked and got back there as soon as we could. And, and it, we were going pretty much against the tide all the way. So we were whipped by the time we got back. Mm-hmm. And about the time we hooked the pea pod back up to pull it up the ramp, we got another call saying they decided to cancel the trip and they'd come out another day. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you learned your lesson, though, I hope. Yeah, we never tried that one again. <laughs> yeah. So in the uh, information you gave me, when we were going back and forth by email. You said something about a, a big uh, lobster cook-a-thon. <laughs> Can you tell me what that was all about? Like I was saying, I used to take lobsters back up to upstate New York on my trip. Mm-hmm. So had a pretty good order coming up. And we had guys who trapped right around had lobster pots right around the, the island. And one guy in particular, I know his name was Jack. I don't remember his last name. But he would call us and say, hey, you guys need anything? And we would tell him, you know, yeah, bring me the Sunday paper or something. we're out of milk or something like that. And he'd usually do it for us. Well, I told them lobsters have to be a certain size. So when they measure them, the ones that aren't quite there, they call them shorts. Mm -hmm. So I tell them if they're close, I'll take them. And so he said, well, I'll have to put the word out because I'm not coming out today. So he got on the, the, back then they all used CV radios to talk between the, the, the lobster boats. Mm-hmm. So I guess he put it out on the on the CV that the boys at Boone Island needed some lobsters. <laughs> and all day they were pulling up with lobsters, way more than I could carry. So we started boiling them and we had lobsters crawling all over the kitchen floor. <laughs> and we boiled them and we actually filled a giant ice cooler full of lobster meat. I, but I didn't want to see another lobster. After that. <laughs> there was a lot of lobsters. Do you like lobster now? I still like lobster. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Seems like I remember a character in a movie whose father was was a lobsterman getting so sick of lobster she never wanted to see it again. But I can't imagine that happening. Yeah, um, so I want to talk about the uh, the blizzard, of course, the blizzard of 78. But before we get into that, I have one more question for you. Sure. Uh, you know, one of the things Boone Island is known for is, well, it's known for shipwrecks. There are some famous shipwrecks there, including the Nottingham Galley from England in 1710, which is a pretty harrowing kind of gruesome story some listeners might know about it there's lots of information on the internet there was a novel based on that called boone island by kenneth roberts it's quite famous so that's that's an quite a a, you know well-known and uh amazing story but uh maybe kind of related to that one of the things boone island is known for is ghost stories uh and i've actually talked to a number of uh, former keepers at boone island including a guy who was there in the early 70s, not long before you, who told me some interesting stories along those lines. But I have to ask you, uh, did you have any odd experiences while you were there? I do remember the stories and the legends and stuff that happened out there. And and I wish I had a great tale about meeting one of the guys who was a haunt in the island. But I don't really recall anything major yeah. other than noises that you heard at night. I don't know what was making the noise. I don't remember being really scared about it, but like asking the other guy, hey, did you hear that pounding last? Yeah, I don't know what it is. And then we'd probably kid each other and say it's yeah. one of Boone's ghosts, but they don't bother you. So we're all out. They're stuck out here too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, there's, uh, yeah, like I said, I've heard heard a lot of stories. Uh, well, the guy who was there in the early 70s told me that one time he and his uh, other crew guy that, you know, they're out there together and they went fishing in the pea pod and they went f- kind of what you did that day. They went farther from the light than they should have gone. And it was getting near sunset and they realized, Oh geez, we got to get back and light the light for sunset. So they're hurrying back, but it seemed like the light came on by itself before they got back to the Island. They landed. There was no sign of anybody on the Island. I'm not quite sure if the door was locked or not, but anyway, there was nobody there. They never figured out who uh, lit the light that night. So and he had other experiences too. So, and I've heard a couple other things, but you know, there's maybe other explanations. I'm not sure <laughs> what, what that would be. <laughs> yeah. But those noises are interesting. Of course, there's a lot of things that can make noises at a place like that. So who knows? So let's talk about the, the blizzard of 78. Uh, be, and let me just mention for people listening who might, if they're not from new England, I guess the storm affected more than new England. It's a pretty famous storm, but 
Uh, it was basically like a hurricane with three feet of snow along with it. Uh, it was an amazing storm. I was living in uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, near Boston at the time, near the coast. And we got we got like three feet of snow or close to it. I was going to college in Boston, but the, you know, everything was closed for for a week, at least a week. And, the, you know, the roads were pretty much closed. It was an incredible storm. Uh, and especially along the coast where there was a big storm surge, uh, extremely high tides, did a lot of coastal damage. So you were like right in the basically the eye of the storm <laughs> being a Boone Island there. So did you know the big storm was coming when it was on its way? I think we knew there was some bad weather coming, but it wasn't like the first one we'd been through. So it was like, okay, you know, it's almost from, I want to say from October until you leave in, or until spring, it's bad weather. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so I don't remember prior to the time it happened and going, oh, we got a major. It, and I don't think weather was hyped the way it is currently at least down here in Georgia and probably everywhere you see a front coming through and you hear about it for days. It's going to be giant. So I, I don't recall all that. I know that Portsmouth Harbor did not ever tell us this is coming. Like, I don't think that, I think we got it first. Mm -hmm. Uh, And as we, when I relate some of the stories about, I think kind of it'll back that up. Well, uh, I think there was another pretty big storm about a week before, as I remember, like there was, I think it was 20 inches or so a week before the big, big one. So there was already a lot of snow on the ground, as I remember. Yeah. It. We didn't get a lot of snow out on right. the ground. Blew it off. Yeah, um, yeah. It would snow, but it didn't, didn't really, except for in some of the crevices. But it was mainly the ice spray was what you would see because you'd get some neat formations in the way the waves would freeze coming onto the rocks. The one thing you learn is when you're out there, that house was pretty sturdy and there there's nowhere to go. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you just made me remember there was a longtime keeper there named Willie Williams from Kittery. And uh, he described uh, th- there was a storm where everything got coated in ice on the Island. And he was looking at that from the top of the tower. And he said it was the, he called it the grandest sight he had ever seen. It was like magical, he said. Yeah, there was some amazing ice formations after a real heavy wind and cold weather. Mm-hmm. Like almost like waves froze solid. That's what it would look like some of the places. It was mm-hmm. neat. Yeah, so I'm sure it was. Yeah. Without seeing it. Yeah. So uh, let me ask you, and uh, I, we have take as much time as you as you want. What happened during the storm? Can you describe the experience, what it was like? Basically, I know I had the four o'clock shift for the weather. And the, the midnight shift, the weather was up. We sent the report in and we went to bed. It was pretty normal. Mm-hmm. Did the, No, it was the other way around. I had the midnight and Leo had the four o'clock. So I was ready to do the eight. So I went down to the weather room, a little weather station we had had the radio and I was looking at it and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. And I hadn't really looked out that much. You could hear the wind howling and the waves crashing, but that was kind of life on the Island. But yeah, I looked at it and I remember reporting everything in. And I remember uh, telling Portsmouth, the wind speeds 125 knots. Portsmouth came back and said, Boone Island, resend your wind speed. And exactly at that moment, the front door caved in. <laughs> the, the bottom floor filled up to about two and a half feet of water. The, all the sockets, the electric sockets around the wall started shooting electricity out of like little uh, lightning bolts. And the radiator started steaming. <sighs> Time to go. <laughs> it was like, holy cow. So Leo was upstairs. You have to come downstairs, go through the causeway to get into the tower. So I yelled to Leo. I said, Leo, let's go. We got to get in the tower. So he's scrambling, getting his stuff. I grabbed a couple fall weather jackets and uh, we had a little go bag with some cane goods and candles in it that we kept in there. We grabbed that. And the whole time the radio was on the dining room table and Portsmouth kept saying, Boone Island, send your wind speed. And, uh, I remember Leo grabbed it, and this is on the Coast Guard Weather Channel, and he said, 
the hell with the wind speed, the surf's up. <laughs> <laughs> we got in the tower. So we got in there and we went up a pretty good bit, maybe like three windows up. And we're looking and it was like crashing in there. So we decided to go a little higher in the light to get out of it. So we are now up about probably 30, 40 feet above the roof of the house where the house met the tower. So yeah. you're looking down and you could look over and you could see the boathouse. And I think that boathouse had a plaque on it that was like from 1906 or something when it was built. So it had seen a lot of storms. Mm hmm. Well, these waves were coming in and they had to be 25, 30 footers breaking right on top of the, of the boathouse. One of them, large one hit the top of it. The uh, boathouse kind of moved like a deck, of, like a house of cards mm -hmm. and just folded in on itself. And then another wave came right on top of it. And when the water cleared, the only thing left was the cement foundation and the winch. There was no wood, no boat, no nothing. And it was like Boone or like Portsmouth Harbor had uh, a camera out there because it wasn't two minutes later. They called us and said, expect a large storm. We needed to weather secure our pea pod. <laughs> <laughs> and I told them, well, that pea pod and the boathouse headed to Cape Cod a little while ago. Yeah. And I think that was the first time they realized things were not the way they should have been out there. It was serious, yeah. And then a little bit later, they called and told us we needed to get in the tower because it was going to get worse. And that's when I told them, and that's when I knew they really didn't understand. I said, we are in the tower. We've been in the tower. It's the only thing above water. Yeah. We've got no options. Yeah. So people, and I think I've seen a few articles, and it might have been one you wrote, um, that said we cowered in the tower to wait out the storm. I wouldn't have said that. I didn't. I wouldn't. And use it was it. funny because Leo, which the last time I had contact with him was like 20 years ago, called me out of the blue and said he had seen that article and he was mad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then, I think I wrote that you took shelter in the tower, but I definitely wouldn't use the word coward. Well, we were scared when we were doing it. It was a scary feeling when you have a like, it's probably a two foot thick wall and it's moving mm -hmm. when those waves were hitting it. But it didn't take long to realize there's nowhere to go. Yeah. You're here, so you might as well sit back and watch the show. And, and that's kind of what we did. And it was unbelievable. I mean, the waves, I don't know how long those heavy waves kept coming until the, you know, I guess probably on the turn of the tide, they started to go down a little bit. But I remember we were looking at the house wondering, wonder what's left. Mm -hmm. And we were looking because it had a flat roof and you're looking straight down on it. And we had an empty 5,000 gallon fuel tank that was floating. And you look down and it was coming towards the house. And we we're like, oh man, that's going to hit the house. It didn't even slow down. It went right through the house and came out the other side. So we knew <laughs> that that wow. house was in bad shape. Yeah. So we spent a pretty long night and uh, the next most of the next day and they finally the kind of went you know the weather subsided they sent a helicopter out to get us um and this was probably the worst part for me is you had to go up to the top of the tower because they couldn't land on the island they lowered a basket down and if you ever seen the ring the walkway around the, the lighthouse yeah little fence we had to get the basket and then climb over the fence and get in the basket Ugh. and it was pretty cold and windy still yeah so i guess i was the dumbest one i did it first <laughs> i got in the basket and like i said you had the prop wash coming down it was cold hanging onto the basket and i could just feel the sensation of going up and it seemed like i was going up for a really long time and I finally, I opened my eyes and I looked up and the helicopter was still like 50 feet up above me. And I was like, huh. <laughs> and I looked down and Boone Island looked like a little thumb in the ocean. <laughs> and uh, they finally brought me up and they had to pry my fingers off the basket to get out. And they told me, we had to get you above the ground uh, wind so you didn't get swung into the prop, the tail prop. Mm -hmm. 
Well, then they went down, and it took a long time for them to finally convince Leo to get in the basket. <laughs> they got us in. We made it in, and then uh, finally got back to the Coast Guard station. The next day or the day after, we went back out to collect any of our belongings and see what the damage was, and it was amazing. Um, the bottom floor of the house, there was probably a foot of space now between where all these boulders, I mean the size of refrigerators, filled the whole floor to the ceiling. Unbelievable. The upstairs didn't even look like there'd been a storm. It was yeah. in perfect shape. Like I said, the boathouse was gone. The uh, helo pad was broken half. And the thing that was probably the most amazing was I walked out to the generator shed because I could hear a noise. Two walls in the ceiling were gone. Nothing that wasn't nailed down was left, and the generator was still running. Ugh. So I guess that would have been a good ad advertisement for that generator company. You know, we, we got what few things we could get, you know, that were up in our rooms, and that was kind of the end of it. And then we found mm -hmm. out later, I got reassigned then to the small mold station um, at Portsmouth Harbor, and then we found out they were going to automate it. I think mm -hmm. there was a small period of time, as I remember, that they were thinking about rebuilding it and remanning it. And then the cost, I think, was like prohibitive to do that. I knew some of the basics of what happened, but to hear from somebody who lived it, to hear, hear the story is just, uh, it, it's, uh, it's great. And uh, I'm happy that we're able to do this. So this is being recorded so other people can hear what what really happened there, you know, and I also, I was going to mention that, um, I don't know if you know this, but there's a history of things like that happening at Boone Island. You probably were there for the worst, <laughs> but um, Joshua Card, who went on after he left Boone Island, after like seven years at Boone Island, if I remember right, 1867 to 1874, then went to Portsmouth Harbor and was keeper of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse for 35 years until he was 86 years old. Wow. But the reason he left Boone Island is because he and his wife and I think at least a couple of their children were there with them, uh, had to go up in the tower because he described it as a tidal wave. He said basically the island was underwater and they had to go up in the tower and the first floor was flooded. They lost a lot of their belongings. So, you know, pretty similar to what you experienced. And I think, I think that's when he or maybe his wife decided that they were going to leave Boone Island. Um, but uh, Willie Williams, keeper who was there for, for many, many years, uh, had similar experiences uh, more than once with the, he and the other family members had to go up in the tower. So I think what you, I think you showed courage through the whole thing. I, I don't know if I would have been able to get off and, you know, do what you did with the helicopter, go up in the basket, uh, as you described. Well, we couldn't leave through the door on the ground. Right, right. There's no other it way was, out. Yeah. It was all covered with rocks and water. You couldn't yeah. It. So yeah. it was either so, spend some more time up in the tower. Or, yeah, yeah. At, I, at that time, and you know, I'm not ashamed to say it, but I didn't used to have any problem with heights. So it didn't really bother me. Actually, after that experience, yeah, I never really liked heights again. It's always kind of like, kind of like a flashback. Because when I looked down, and it might have been just the whole ordeal, but it, it left an impression on me, believe me. I can com completely understand that. And it's not hard to believe at all. I think I'd be terrified of heights after that. So shortly after you left there, the Coast Guard decided rather than uh, repairing the house, which would have cost a fortune, of course, uh, they decided to automate the light at that time. So you were, you were one of the two, or one of the last crew there. And you were one of the last keepers actually on the island with uh, what the other man's name again was Leo. Leo Berry. So you, you guys were the last keepers on the island after... 167 years of keepers there going back to 1811 so to me or you you know you had a, a role in history there uh and to me one of the most important you know interesting light stations lighthouses in the country do you think about that at all do you think about playing a, a part in that that history like you did i don't know about especially then as a historical part i know it always made a major impression on my life it's a moment that I think about that I'm actually glad I was able to go through it mm. uh, just because nature and the power of nature, uh, I have seen it unleashed a few times in my life. That was might've been the biggest, but I think it made 
me, this may sound a little weird, but it made me appreciate life more. Like I, I like events now. I like, I just feel good about stuff. And when I yeah. see things and get to live experiences, I really savor them. So. Yeah, no, it's, that's not weird at all. It's far, far from it. Uh, I think, uh, you know, near death experiences will make you uh, appreciate life, life more. I mean, you say it that way. I don't ever really think of it as a near death. It was, yeah. just, it was just an awesome view of nature that most yeah. people never see. Yeah. Yeah. You're, I think there's probably the smart person probably would have been fear and death, but <laughs> um, I just, I don't remember that part of it. Maybe I yeah. did, but it's just like there wasn't, you know, there's kind of fight or flight reaction. Well, you couldn't really do either. Right. That's true. Yeah. So you were just there and you just had to, it's kind of like, well, let's, this is neat. Mm -hmm. to, it was neat to watch. Yeah. <laughs> the job that I had had out of Portsmouth is they put me on a cable boat, which would have been great for you. Cause what we did is we fixed all the power and telephone to the near coast lighthouses from Boston all the way up to uh, Bucks Harbor, Maine was mm. the last, the farthest northern light that we went up and worked on. Okay. So wow. We visited quite a few lights. I don't yeah. remember what the names of all of them were, <laughs> but we got to see quite a few of them. Wow. Well, that's neat. Did you, so you actually spent time at the, the light stations? Uh, and, well, what we did is the cables, like the power and the phone cables that went out there, they would break. Mm -hmm. so we had a boat that had basically a giant hook we dragged on a cable and we had charts that showed where the cables were supposed to be, but which mm -hmm. they never were there because uh, the currents would move them, especially if they broke. Yeah. We'd hook the cables, bring it up on these rollers, and then the technicians would come out and they'd splice that cable back together mm -hmm. and drop it back down and huh. reach it. Neat. So you didn't, you only had uh, less than a year actually as a lighthouse keeper at Boone Island, right? But you got yeah, to, it was quite a bit less. It got cut pretty short. Yeah. And but then, a lot happened in the, those, uh, those few yeah, months. It, my whole four years in the Coast Guard, it was an adventure. It really was almost, I mean, we did a lot of neat stuff with, when I was at the small boat station the last, mm -hmm. I guess, eight to 10 months of my time in the Coast Guard was on a small boat crew. So Yeah. If you don't mind me asking, what uh, what did you do after you left the Coast Guard? What was uh, the main part of your your career all about? Um, well, actually, uh, I got out of the Coast Guard. I got married. My wife and I were expecting our first child. Didn't really have uh, health insurance. I joined the Army. Uh, oh, okay. Was, uh, Fort Drum was advertising at that time. The 10th Mountain Division was going to be built with guys from the North Country. So I was thinking, well, I'll just go here at Fort Drum. It'll be like working, you know, from home. Mm -hmm. So I joined the, the Army. I spent the next 17 years in the Army as a military intelligence officer, switched things over, went through the, the 80s in the Army, and then the, through the mid-90s in 96, uh, we had, as you know, there was a lot going on in the world at that time. And then when I got out of the army and retired, my plan was to actually move back to New York, uh, mm -hmm. back to my hometown. My wife's from that area. My kids loved Georgia. Um, mm -hmm. It was probably the longest place they'd ever lived. So I got a job offer to, as a systems engineer uh, for the National Security Agency here at, at Fort Gordon, Georgia, mm -hmm. and as a contractor, but working for them in support. And I've been doing that. Uh, since 96 and mm -hmm. I have 14 working days left until I'm retired <laughs> oh wow congratulations <laughs> well thank you I have two more questions for you and sure. uh, these are for bonus points okay right. so get ready here all right so uh, what was your favorite thing about your time at Boone Island for the most part it was kind of a it, all I remember is it was a pretty laid-back easy job to do. I mean, mm -hmm. to, to be honest, and as a 19, 20 year old kid with, it was nice. Two weeks out there was kind of like a rest. And then I'd go home and do what 20 year olds did back in 1977. So. 
Yeah. Yeah. And if you could, would you do it all over again? Uh, definitely. Yeah. All of it. Every bit of it. Uh huh. Probably the only thing I might change <laughs> if I was really going to change is I might have did my 21 years of military service in the Coast Guard. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say you changed you getting in that basket and going up into the <laughs> helicopter. <laughs> but I guess you didn't have much choice about I'd that. I waited until they dug the door out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, the Coast Guard's a great branch of the service for sure. And, uh, you know. And, but, and not to say I didn't have some good times in the Army too, but it's a different atmosphere. Yeah. Well, Kirby Eldridge, it, you know, I feel like we could we could talk for for hours more here. It's just uh, I'm absolutely fascinated by all of it, and uh, you know, maybe we can talk again sometime. But uh, it's again, I really appreciate the fact that you got in touch with me because uh, Boone Island has been a one of my biggest interests. Sometimes people ask me what my favorite lighthouse is, and Boone Island, I never think of Boone Island first as like the prettiest, <laughs> but as far as the history, it's right up there at the top of the list. I wrote a book on Maine lighthouses and Boone Island was the longest chapter. So uh, I've been fascinated by it for a long time. So to talk to somebody like you, who's, who played such a big role in its history, you know, it's a, it's a treat for me. So I want to thank you again so much. Thank you. As a side note, I was, uh, I spent two weeks on Cape Nettick too. You did? Yeah. When uh, his name was O'Brien, I can't remember his first name. Him and his wife were the lighthouse keepers and they went on vacation. Okay. Was that small boat station? They said, "You know what you're doing. You go up there and be the lighthouse keeper." Well, I should put you on my uh, my list of keepers for Cape Nettick Nubble. <laughs> There's only two weeks. Yeah. yeah. So that would have been in '77 at some point. Probably the summer of '78, maybe. Oh, okay. Um, All right. It was quite a difference from uh, Boone Island. Oh, th that lighthouse is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a lot of visitors that came out. Some yeah. young female sometimes. It was kind of good. Yeah, it sounds really good. Uh, Connie Small, who wrote the book, The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife, uh, spent uh, almost 30 years at various lighthouses with her husband. They filled in sometimes at the Nubble. And she said she loved it there, but she said it felt like they were in a goldfish bowl, like somebody was always watching them from the mainland. Yeah, the parking <laughs> lot was normally full. Yeah, yeah. But uh, definitely a, a more uh, pleasant, peaceful place to be than Boone Island. But again, uh, Kirby, I, I thank you so much for spending time with me. And uh, let's uh, do it again sometime. All right, sure. I found this interview to be one of the most interesting I've done. Just imagine being in a place like Boone Island during one of the worst storms in New England history. So uh, what would you think of the interview, Bob? The interview was fascinating, Jeremy. Kirby was really fun to listen to, very informative, uh, but you got a sense when you were listening to recount the memories. It struck me, these guys didn't know this was coming. Mm -hmm. So they were sort of just taken by surprise with all of this. And at that time, you had no chance to even think about, should I be afraid, whatever. I mean, you just had to react. You know, when that water's coming in the house, they just had to move, you know. And I'm thinking about this as he's saying, I'm saying, this is, most of the lighthouses in Maine, they were scheduled for automation boone island went out on its own terms because mm -hmm. after this storm it was it was automated and yeah. that i i think that was one thing that certainly came to mind i think another was um these guys were just they weren't able to attend to the foghorn probably weren't really able to attend much to the light they really just were trying to survive and ride out that storm yeah. so that was huge i think the last thing you know, I have landed at lighthouses and other offshore sites by basket, being lower from a helicopter. But when you get in that basket, you're inside the helicopter. It's it's a solid platform. Yeah. A rescue swimmer precedes you down. When it goes down, you land it, and you come out, you get back in that basket. It's an awkward thing, but you're always solid. So as Kirby's talking about this, and this helo is up above the lighthouse, and they've got a basket up against the railing outside and i know that that is not a wide gallery right to think with the wind blowing no stable basket that helicopter trying to hold position over this lighthouse and, and keep themselves safe yeah and then you're expected to get into this thing 130 some feet in the air yeah i could see why leo had some pause about doing something like that <laughs> yeah yeah oh it's terrifying just to, to hear about it never mind doing it uh it's absolutely incredible what those what those guys went through that day 
or those days, I should say. So, Bob, uh, you found an, an article or a uh, document uh, online, which is really interesting. Uh, and where did that come from? That was the uh, 1982 edition of the uh, U.S. Coast Guard AIDS Navigation Bulletin. And I remember Kirby mentioning in his interview about um, the possibility of the Coast Guard looking to maybe renovate the place and reestablish mm-hmm. it as a, as a staff station and then abandon that thought. And I remembered that there was this article from 1982 yeah. that mentioned how this Coast Guard crew got on the island. And uh, you have that document in your hands, Jeremy. I do. Yeah, I've got it right here. Yeah, they uh, they talk uh, early in it about when uh, Spar, the, the cutter, Coast Guard cutter Spar, was given the task to renovate Boone Island Light in July 81. It says, we found that many of our initial solutions to the task had to be modified significantly once on scene. Uh, for one thing, they had trouble uh, landing uh, boats <laughs> on the island to do what they needed to do. That in itself is, is not easy. But then uh, it goes on to talk about the actual uh, demolition of the house. I'll just read uh, a bit of that paragraph. The most spectacular event of the project was the raising of the lightkeeper's house. The house was constructed of a granite foundation with a wood and plasterboard second floor. To prepare the house, we first removed all large non-burnable items and knocked ventilation holes as strategic areas in the building. With a favorable wind, the house was doused with fuel oil and ignited. As the superstructure burned, it fell below the found into the foundation, which served as a sort of fire pit. The light tower was kept cool under a constant spray from a PE-250, some sort of hose, I guess, and sustained only the minimal damage of a few cracked windows. The fire burned from mid-afternoon until well into the evening. Then it goes on to talk about how they got the trash out of there and stuff. Um, there is a photo uh, that I think might be at the National Archives, the original, of uh, the smoke rising from the house while it was being uh, burned, or with the, while the burnable parts of it were being burned. Of course, there's still a little bit, bit of that house out there, Bob, which I think you mentioned earlier. Yes, there is a little bit of the uh, the walls and inner uh, core of the house. When you listen to what Kirby talked about and how he said that the uh, all those boulders at rock was all through the house there was not much airspace in the first floor uh you can it, you, that picture you refer to jeremy it's a it's a sad set but you can almost understand it there was really no other way i mean this was um the sea had really done the house in Boone island and with it like i said the uh, the lighthouse in its own way um, decided on its terms it was going to be time for automation yeah yeah no, it, it makes sense it's it's too bad. It's it makes um, the fact that there's no house there now kind of makes the preservation of the lighthouse tower more daunting than it would be. But um, we wish uh, Bobby Sager all the best with with that uh, project. We can say that the lighthouse though is still an activated navigation, and does have a light, an LED light, and a foghorn, and it is maintained by the uh, Coast Guard AIDS navigation team out of South Portland. Yeah, still uh, and still visible from. Uh, a lot of a lot of points on land. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our listeners have been to the Cape Netic Nubble, the famous Nubble Lighthouse in York, Maine. You go to the park there to view that lighthouse and look in the right direction off in the distance, and you see Boone Island looking like a, I always say it looks like a, a pencil sticking out of the water way in the distance. So, Bob, you are uh, one of a, a very small number of people who's uh, actually been on that island since the uh, keepers lived there uh, when it was automated. Let me try that again. So, Bob, you're one of a very small number of people who have actually been on the island since the days uh, when the Coast Guard keepers were there, which is uh, 1978, of course, again, is when they left. When you visit these places, you must uh, think about the things that keepers and families live through in a place like that over the years. I very much do, Jeremy. It's um, one of the things that I always tell myself is, is that the sea does not change. The ledge does not change at these places. Uh, so you are literally retracing the steps of the keepers and their families. So at a place like Boone Island, I think one of the things for me was to think that families were out here. You know, you could see the keepers being up, but then you think children. Yeah. And I think of how did they amuse themselves? How did they, how did they stay from, you know, keep from being bored? And of course, it was a different time and place, and and they definitely were resourceful and they found all kinds of ways to entertain themselves. But I mean, literally day after day, this is a barren ledge. You know, and even some of the tide pools on, on Boone Island, I'm sure it hasn't changed all that much. Some of the water gets so stagnated and disgusting. Mm-hmm. I mean, the whole island just reeks in the summertime. 
yeah. from the guano and from the seals being there and all that I think of the children and I'm thinking, man, they, it's pretty amazing. I mean, the, the stories they too could tell. Yeah. You know? Well, we do have some stories like grandchildren of uh, keeper Willie Williams, you know, talking about one of them, uh, talking about roller skating on the boardwalks that connected the, the uh, buildings because you couldn't, you could barely walk on the rocks, never mind roller skate on them. But another little girl uh, on the island talked about uh, how she would go out and play on the rocks. And she said the seals were her army. And if a whale went by, it was a submarine. <laughs> you know, So you made your own fun at these places. You had no it choice. You did. And I remember you, I think you have a picture of uh, children playing with what looks to be like toy sailboats in the small ponded areas there on Boone Island. And uh, that I remember that picture as I was there. And it was something I recalled on them like, yeah, I could see that actually happening. There's a lot of games and things that the kids could have played, but still a place like that. And then you think about what the families, what mom must have thought about, you know, when storms came up and, and how the children were going to be safe. And, you mm -hmm. know, we know there were accounts of the families going into the tower for safety during storms. Yeah. So you think about the emotions. Uh, it's not just the boredom, but uh, some of the, um, the aspect, are the kids getting hurt? You know, if they do get hurt, they're far from land. Mm -hmm. And that's true of any of those offshore lights. But a place like Boone Island really does make you think, like, yeah, this is this is amazing that people actually did live out here like here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I used to give, uh, you know, lighthouse tours in the area, and we'd drive along the coast of York there, and I'd point out Boone Island and tell people about it. And that that's the first thing I would say. I, I can't believe that families lived out there for so many years. And again, I'll mention that girl, uh, Annie Bell Hobbs, 14 years old, when she wrote an article for a children's magazine about life there. I think it was 1876. And I, I love how she started the article. I think she had been there like three years at that point. She, she wrote, uh, I've, I've been here uh, three years where I've, I've been a prisoner with privilege of the yard. <laughs> that aptly sums it up, I believe, for some children who might not have thought Boone Island was all that great. So thank you so much for co-hosting today, Bob. Uh, I've interviewed you before. You've taken part in interviews before on the podcast. This is your first time as co-host, and I've really enjoyed it. We'll have to do it again sometime. We will. I had a blast. And hey, anytime you can talk about a place like Boone Island and uh, hang out with somebody, good friend like you, it's uh, it makes for a fun day. Agreed. And uh, thank you so much for making the uh, five-hour round trip from uh, Owl's Head, the American Lighthouse Foundation headquarters down here to Portsmouth. So I want to mention that people can learn more about the American Lighthouse Foundation and its chapters at lighthousefoundation.org. ALF takes care of 17 lighthouses in the northeastern U.S. Any ALF or ALF, I should say, news you'd like to tell our listeners about? There's some cool things happening right now, Jeremy. I'm just going to briefly touch on a couple. Uh, in September, uh, the Fourth Order Fresnel Lens is returning to Palm of Rocks Lighthouse. And you can tell me what museum that's coming from again? The Custom House Maritime Museum in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Got it. Also, um, Little River Light in Cutler, Maine. The Keeper's House and the Tower, as we speak, are being repainted. Uh, so that's a really exciting thing. And uh, Pemaquid Point Lighthouse will have an exterior repainting here starting tomorrow. It oh, will wow. begin the process starting tomorrow. That project will probably last about a week to two weeks. Mm -hmm. So there's some exciting things that are happening uh, restoration-wise and the Fresnel Lens coming home at Palm and Rocks. Yeah, well, that's, that's really exciting. And uh, also, uh, let me remind people to check out uslhs.org to learn uh, more about everything the U.S. Lighthouse Society has to offer. Remember that donations and memberships in the USLHS support this podcast and other education and restoration activities. Next week's episode of Lighthearted will feature an interview with Brian Teft, director of Rose Island Lighthouse in Newport, Rhode Island. To all our listeners, thank you for listening and keep a good light. I'm gonna let it shine out in the dark. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, this little light of mine.